Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for part one of the Institute for Local Self-Reliances Scaling Up Community Composting webinar series. This first one is called Scaling Up Mission-Driven Community Composting. I am Clarissa Libertelli. I coordinate the Community Composter Coalition for ILSR's Composting Initiative. Um, I'm joined here today by the Composting Initiatives Director, Brenda Platt, and Jordan Ashby, our Communications Lead, so they're helping with the back end, um, and their cameras will be off, but you can see their beautiful faces here, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Uh, we do have part two in this series already scheduled for June 26th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It will be scaling up local circular composting, so focus a little bit more on the keeping the composting process local aspect of community composting and scaling that up in different models for doing so. And we have some great panelists lined up. You can check out the link in the chat to see who those are. But today we have Christy from Compost Crew, David from Compost Now, and Michael from Rust Belt Riders. Um, and I'll be giving you a little more info about them right before their presentations. But first, I just want to say really quickly that the Institute for Local Self Lines has a whole host of different resources to promote community composting. Um, besides our policy work that also does that, we convene a forum, uh, in-person forum of our Community Composter Coalition, which has over 300 members, both nationally and internationally. We have workshops, webinars. Um, we have a host of infographics, a training course on how to do community composting that's all online. So definitely check that out on our website. And we have a whole bunch of different webinars that you can see. I believe they're pretty much all free on our website, recordings available. Our most recent series is probably of interest to a number of you. Um, it is government support for community composting, so definitely relevant. Um, and so that link will also be in the chat for you to check out. And just a little reminder, we are looking at, we promote, you know, composting across the board, but really our initiative is focused on small scale decentralized composting, which is what community composting addresses, um, and less so the centralized industrial composting that, that doesn't keep all of the benefits of composting local. So we're going to run a couple of quick polls right now just to see who is on this call today. So Jordan's going to help me out here, and you'll soon see a poll on the screen. Just select all that apply to you. Um, are you a community composter, food scrap collection service? Maybe you're both of those things. Local government, state, or federal government? Let's see who's with us today. And when we get a good number of you participating, let's close that poll out. So let's see those results. All right, got a lot of community composters. That's great. And also a good chunk of government showing up. So, and some other, wonder what that means. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. So I also wanna know from those of you that do run a community composting program, what is the state or your level of interest in scaling up if you could get that poll up? So which of the following best describes you? This one's just to select one. Are you currently scaling up your program? Are you interested in starting to scale it up? Or are you interested in how to support your community composters who want to scale up? So just trying to see where people are coming at this webinar from and why you're here today. You probably close that one now too soon. Uh, 
All right, a lot of folks are currently scaling up. We got about a quarter that are interested in starting to scale up, and then a third interested in how to support community composters. So that's great. Thank you all for joining today. And um, this kind of is reflected in some of the feedback that ILSR has gotten. We conducted a census last year of community composters, both in our coalition and from outside of our coalition. And this is kind of a word cloud of what people reported their top challenges were. Scaling up operations was the biggest challenge. It came up both in business and the financial side and also in site operations. So that could be equipment, that could be access to land, all sorts of things like that. So that's exactly why we're doing this webinar today is to address that challenge. And that's where we have our lovely presenters. Um, and I'll get into who everyone is right before their presentation. But first, we have Christy Blummer from Compost Crew. Uh, they're based in Rockville, Maryland. Shout out to where I grew up. Um, and Christy leads the composting division at Compost Crew, which is a business that services over 20,000 clients, including homes, businesses, and municipalities in the DC area. Um, and they have a really interesting model of partnering with farms for their uh, compost processing. So I'm sure we'll hear a bit about that, but handing it over to Christy now. All right. Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, you're perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you all for having me. I'm so happy to talk with like-minded community composters and different organizations about the benefits of local composting. So thank you for having me again. My name is Christy Blummer, and I'm the Senior Director of Composting at Compost Crew. Uh, like Clarissa said, um, we're based in the Maryland region. We service Maryland, Washington, D.C., and Virginia. And um, we started very small and have scaled up since then. So excited to talk to you about our journey. So to get us started, uh, a little bit about our history. So we started back in 2011. There was two guys with a pickup truck who just wanted to get a food scrap collection service started. And so they did it all themselves. They partnered with a local farm, um, you know, collected food scraps from the local community and then made their own compost. Um, and since then, we've grown exponentially. So we were able to get some pretty key partnerships with communities and small municipalities, which helped our collection service grow. Uh, we then started and just focused on the collection side of things. So then we partnered with local municipality run composting facilities and grew our collection system. Um, since then, back in 2018, um, we were able to purchase a commercial, um, commercial company that had larger trucks. Then we got into the commercial sphere of food scrap collection. And then from there, we were able to hit some huge milestones, a lot more tonnage. Um, and then since then, um, been able to service larger municipalities um, to where we are today, which is where we're serving up to, you know, 20,000 residences, residents, businesses, municipalities all throughout our region. We have 70 plus employees and we're composting now again, just based on coming back from our origin. Um, back in 2020, we're starting to compost ourselves which is the team that I lead. And I'm excited to talk to you about all of the fun initiatives that we've been doing on our composting side as well. So that's a bit about our company. Um, we are a mission-driven company, which you can see our mission here. And we are a for-profit business. So what Clarissa has presented in the beginning was how do you balance a business, a for-profit business with community composting where you wanna be mission-driven, you wanna engage the community and you wanna produce high quality material for our environment uh, and for our healthy soil, healthy food. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we focus on our mission. So we partner with a lot of different organizations. Um, a couple are food recovery organizations. So of course you want 
to educate. Um, a lot of community composters could probably support this. I think the most uh, work I do with my job is just to educate what I do uh, and what food scrap collection and composting really means. And that starts with this hierarchy, right? So starting with how could I reduce the amount of food that I'm eating? Uh, then if I can't eat it, how can I give it to someone or something that could then utilize it as well? So we partner with a lot of food recovery organizations um, to either provide food scrap collection services for material they can't utilize or be able to provide support in different ways, funding. And then we also want to work with different farms, um, ways to then be able to support our food that's being produced on farm as well as being on food gets back to our animals. Um, and then after that, of course, we want to compost as much as possible before it gets anywhere and is close to a landfill or incinerator. So as a company, we're trying to support, support this closed loop solution, which is how can we get the food scraps from our community to a local space for composting, whether that's a large scale facility that's that's run by a municipality or one, or one of our own composting facilities, um, or we have an anaerobic digester now in our area too. So how can we get this food scraps to the closest material space to pr produce a high quality end product? Then, um, for example, partnering with our local farm, um, how can we get that material back to our community members, so the people that, that work with us, back to our local farms, back to our community gardens, um, to then be able to support healthy soil and growth of potentially healthy food or animals, um, to then go back to those community members. So that closed loop solution. Um, the more closed loop we can get, the more it makes sense environmentally and econ economically. So how have we been able to do that has been one of our missions as a company and specifically for me, how can I do that on the composting side of things? So to get into that, we have a decentralized composting model. So what that means is we're trying to reduce the amount of environmental and economical tax that our drivers take collecting food scraps from a large waste generator a far, far away to a large centralized facility, composting facility or anaerobic digester. So how can we get the composting closer to those community members? Well, we wanted to create our own decentralized composting model where basically we create a more smaller sized model um, that can make a large impact. So an example is we partner with a lot of local farms in the uh, DC metro region. Um, we also partner with municipally run locations, even vacant lots, um, anything to get a smaller sized um, composting model put together to be able to support a local composting sphere. So our routes can be targeted um, to go to a closer space, which saves us money. It also saves our uh, labor time, which is really important. Money is time uh, and time is money. And then also we're able to produce higher quality local compost. In our region, there really isn't a lot of local compost being generated. We only have a couple uh, large scale municipalities that generate our local compost. And aside from that, it's, it's really non-existent and especially not in a high quality scale. So how can we also target a higher quality material that can then go back to our farm partners or our local community? So an example of some of these um, are listed here. So uh, our first farm, which I always love to highlight, is out in our um, where we're based, Montgomery County, Maryland, um, which is actually the first farm that we partnered with when we started in 2011, uh, which is very cool. So we're able to work with them again um, when we decided to restart composting in 2020 and be able to build a composting system. This could not have been possible without the help with of Eco City Farms. A lot of people, a lot of you know about this uh, amazing organization. Um, and Benny Erez, who we always say is the guru of composting, um, who's able to help us design a ideal um, modular composting system, which you can see in these pictures. You can also see it in my virtual background, where basically we're trying to make an ideal space for aerated static pile composting. So what is that? Basically composting is an aerated process. If we could force aeration into a pile that is being controlled ideally, then hopefully we can process that material at a higher quality, um, at a more regulated scale. Um, we're hitting our temperatures that we need, our moisture, our porosity, our density levels, all controlled in one space um, in a semi-in-vessel system, where basically we have forced air pipes underneath 
these shipping containers that we locally sourced, uh, reused from Baltimore up into these piles um, on an intermittent scale. And then from there, we carbon cap the material to try to trap that air and nutrient level moisture content so that it's being processed at an ideal level. From there, we'll take it out and put it into a passively aerated windrow space uh, and then a cure pile to then be distributed um, back to our uh, farms or community members. So these are some of our amazing partners um, and we're excited to talk about some of these ways that you can really get into a more closed loop solution. So an example of this is how can we get this done? Uh, we're talking about smaller sized um, spaces. So it is hard at a smaller size to be able to be very economical, right? We're kind of at that net zero level, um, especially when we got started because we've had to figure out how can we do all this work, you know, labor, it's a minimal amount of labor because we're using area that pile systems versus wind drawing, but it, we're still trying to make a high quality compost. So we by hand decontaminate our loads of food scraps. So if there's something that is inorganic that accidentally got into our food scraps, we'll take it out by hand. Um, so that takes a lot of time and, and labor. So how can we make this economically possible? One way we did it was through grants. So there's now this community um, grant system that the USDA has put together that we're able to win um, with some local municipalities, which was has been an amazing partnership. Um, as you can see here, one is um, in a local town in Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, they're a smaller town municipality that is not supported from the incorporation of their larger county. So they handle their own waste system. So we're able to work with them to be able to produce our own compost. And this is actually our closed, our most closed loop solution that we partner with right now. So basically we're able to, to fill a full truck with all of the food scraps that we collect in a very small town, be able to drop it off at a local composting site in that town that could then process the material with only in-town materials. So that's the, the carbon source, which is wood chips, sleeves, hay, things like that, that we get from the local city um, with the food scraps we get from the local town, all produced on site that then can go back to that community member, community gardens, um, wherever we need to do in that local City. It's our most closed loop solution. It's such a small footprint. And that's where we can really make a huge difference. And luckily, we were able to work with this grant funding to get it, make it happen, to really present how this could, this could work long term, um, even without grant money, if we really needed to. Um, we also were able to do the same thing with a small town in uh, Edmondson, another town in Prince George's County, again, incorporated. And we're able to partner with amazing organizations like Eco City, um, also our uh, local counties, Parks and Rec, um, our Soil Conservation District, and other local towns to support the food scrap collection system. And this is on a farm, which is so cool. It's an incubator farm. We're able to support not only composting the food scraps that are not being utilized from the town, but also from the farm and go back to the farm and the community garden that's right next door. So that closed loop solution is really presenting a way of decentralized composting at a grand scale. Um, and a little bit about what we collect, because I think it's important to see um, what we do at our collection surface versus our composting space. So we collect all meat, bone, dairy at a community scale level, as well as at the large municipalities we partner with. Um, Obviously, you can see what we don't collect, which is always equally, if not more important of what we don't collect. And a little uh, bit about this is the compostable plastics. I know that's a huge topic in the composting world. Um, for us, uh, compostable plastics is a great way to get away from petroleum-based plastics. Um, so we do support it with our collection system to be able to take um, compostable plastics and we divert them to our larger municipalities. At our local scale, we try to take this material out, um, mostly because we don't have a shredder on site. Um, it does break down at a different time scale than the rest of our material. And if they're in liners that are tied, we have to open up every single liner to be able to homogeneously mix the material inside with all of our carbon sourcing. So we actually take those materials out of our loads at our local spaces and bring it, bring it out to our municipal contracted partners. Um, so that's a little bit of the difference of what we are able to take at a local scale that we, what local sized spaces that we utilize versus a larger scale, um, larger facilities. Um, so that's a bit about what we do. And an exciting part about this whole partnership is there are ways that we can 
not only be mission driven um, and a for profit, but we can also engage with our local community to create high quality compost. We also do a lot of this work with uh, a fellowship program that we've generated. So trying to educate our future composters as well. Labor is always an issue when it comes to um, uh, uh, composting. Uh, it's something that a lot of people don't really know about. So a lot of our labor sources have to be educated. So having the fellowship program is not only great for educating our future composters, um, we've also are probably the leading organization of getting them certified um, in the Maryland composting world um, to be able to operate on their own side or with us in the future. So it's also a great way to not only help promote community composting and education, but also as a potential labor source as well for us, which works out really well. Um, so that's a bit about what we do um, and a little bit about us. So for our kind of a summary of who we are and what we've done, we've gone from um, working in just a community scale, building density on our routes, focused on food scrap collection, to where we're trying to do the same thing with our composting side as well, trying to promote density, high quality material compost, high quality food scrap collection service um, in, our in our local DC metro region. So that's it for me. Uh, let me know if you have any questions and thank you for your time. Awesome, thank you, Christy. Great to see that example of how you can compost on a large scale, but still keep it local, close the loop, keep high quality compost. That's all super key to returning those benefits to local communities. Um, we do have a, we're going to get to most of the questions at the end in a Q&A session, so you can keep those coming in the Q&A, um, but we do have a couple minutes right now. Uh, I'm going to ask you one of them that came in. Um, Christy, somebody asked, how do you manage the relationships with land, through landowners and compost site operators? Do you have memorandums of understanding? Is it a land rental? Can you say anything about the kind of way that you structure those partnerships? Yeah, I definitely can. Do you want me to stop sharing? Would that be easier to keep it up? You can keep it up. Okay. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, this is a huge topic for us as community composters, especially when we're looking at small size locations, which means most likely we don't own the space. Um, so we have to maintain uh, a great relationship to be able to compost at those locations. We partner with nine different locations in the DC metro region, all drastically different partners. Um, each one has their own specific unique uh, partnership as well. So an example, One Acre Farm is a farm where we piloted our first outpost. Uh, and so we pay a lease, we have a lease agreement um, this is a shorter term lease, it's about three years that we've extended to you know, three to five, um, and the lease is uh, eligible to change. We also, within the lease, have a lot of amazing um, ways that we synergize together. So an example, we own uh, the skid steer at that location. So um, we let the farmer use our skid steer at any time. We share payment on fuel. We're able to help uh, pay for the fuel that's located at the site for his tractor and equipment, but also ours. Um, we share uh, electricity, they have solar on their barn. So we help pay for not just um, electricity, but also water usage that's on farm. So we're hopefully providing not only funding to be able to promote our own composting, but we're also supporting a local farmer who's also a mission-driven for-profit business that, that supports a community um, supported agricultural um, CSA program. So that's an example. One on the completely other side, um, is that we have a municipal contract. So we have a contract where we are only the subcontractor doing the composting. So we don't own the infrastructure. The municipality bought the infrastructure. We don't own the equipment. We're approved and tested to use their equipment on site. So we don't have a lease. We have a contract with that space. Um, and then we have everything in between. But I do recommend you always have a contract going into um, a partnership on but on-site system if you want to be able to compost, especially if you're putting in funding and money into the into the space. So definitely get a long-term contract if you can. Thanks, Christy. Really appreciate that answer and your presentation. That was great. Um, David, if you want to start pulling up your slides while I give you a brief intro, feel free to do that. 
So David Paul is Chief Impact Officer with Compost Now. Uh, they're serving communities in four different states now, I believe, and have diverted 75 million pounds of food scraps since their founding in 2011. Um, and David is now going to talk to us a little bit about how all of that huge scaling up, incredible progress has also stayed mission driven. So I'll hand it over to you. Great. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, for some reason, I can't see it. Hmm. There we go. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I'm happy to be here with you today. My name is David Paul. I'm the Chief Impact Officer and co-founder of Compost Now, um, and I'm excited to share with you today a bit of our story of scaling. I think it is certainly, uh, you know, a really important topic uh, because I think a lot of community composters are rooted in the mission of this work. Uh, I know Compost Now certainly is, and uh, I'll share with you some of my own personal journey of how I ended up doing this work. Uh, so I think this topic of scale is really important uh, as we continue to uh, get further along within this uh, movement, as there's also many other things moving around us and the industry has developed uh, an incredible amount at a pretty fast rate since we've started this work. So Compost Now has you know, been operating since 2011, uh, and we've been really focused on trying to make composting as easy and simple uh, as, you, as we can to bring it to as many communities as possible uh, to accomplish the mission of diverting food waste from landfills to build healthy soil locally. So in this time uh, that we've been doing this work, we've, of course, learned a lot. Uh, there's been multiple different uh, ways that we've uh, done the actual collection of the material. Uh, but currently, we, we operate a, a fleet of uh, light to medium scale uh, trucks and step vans or uh, sprinter vans. And we also operate uh, our own composting facility in the Atlanta market while we partner with third party uh, composting facilities in the, in the other markets that we service. Uh, so we've had experience at pretty much every scale of this work. Uh, Dating all the way back to 2011, when we got started uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, a lot of the intention behind this work is very much rooted in the the uh, mission of developing healthy soil within our communities and seeing that there is a resource that we all have, that is our food scraps, that we can cycle into creating healthy soil. So when we started it, it started very simply and humbly with again this passion to solve this problem and to make a difference within our communities and then really taking it into our own hands of using our personal vehicles uh setting up uh you know aggregation points for collecting the material and then washing the containers that we're collecting it within partnering with local farms and gardens uh in a decentralized way to process this food scraps that we're collecting in some of the markets that we were in uh, running bike routes, uh, you know, there, there's been, so, again, so many different ways that we've done this work over the years, but the core effort has continued to be make composting as easy as possible, bring it to as many communities as we can to accomplish that, that core impact of diverting food waste from landfills and building an abundance of, of nutrient-dense uh, soil locally, compost locally. So over the years, as I mentioned, the you know there was a lot of effort and time spent getting out into the community to educate our community on the value of composting, the ways that it can be done, uh, the the sheer power and magic of composting, and all the the benefits that come from it uh, that are are multiple and plentiful. So you know we've done things like created the compost kitchen in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, where we are able to. Uh, educate our community on on how the compost process works and actually set up demo days where we're turning piles together and mixing the material together and talking about what's actually happening within the process. Because as we many of us know, there's no better way to understand composting than actually to experience it, to, to get your hands dirty and, and feel that kind of transformational power that comes from 
composting. And then we've spent you know, countless hours at farmers markets and uh, different community meetings, uh, going and speaking to schools at, at every level, uh, talking to politicians. And a lot of that work that we did in the early days of the business was out of necessity. It was, there were a lot, a lot fewer people talking about composting. There weren't uh, really, you know, ESG hadn't exploded yet. There weren't sustainability officers in cities. There weren't sustainability positions within corporations. Uh, you know, we were at the beginning of a lot of that. And therefore, it, it necessitated the importance of getting out in the community and making sure that we're connected uh, and helping our, our educate that uh, within that progression into the work that we're doing. One of the other ways, you know, that I mentioned we uh, executed our routes in the early days was via bike based collections uh, that happened with a couple of the community composters that ended up coming into the fold with compost now, including the organization that I started in Atlanta called Compost Wheels in 2012, uh, as well as Tilty Rich in Durham, North Carolina. So along the pathway of doing, you know, all this community work, being out in the community, trying to expand uh, access to composting across more and more communities, that and that ultimately leads to this opportunity uh, to scale and to grow. We, we all know that there's demand for this. We all know that there's a tremendous need for this. Uh, so scale kind of came with that journey. And the I, it, the, I would say the pursuit of scale doesn't come from uh, a place of uh, pursuit of profitability uh, or return of profit to shareholders in the beginning. It comes from a place of wanting to accomplish, again, that core mission of diverting food waste from landfills and building healthy soil. But when you look at that core, uh, you know, core impact, what is also created off of that is if you divert more food waste from landfills uh, and build more healthy soil, you're also creating economic uh, benefit within that, that process. So we knew that, you know, we could continue to do what we wanted to accomplish to do and continue to to build a organization that is financially viable. Uh, so one of the pathways that Compost now took, as I just mentioned, was uh, partnering with other uh, community compost and organizations. So I, that's my story. How I came into Compost now was uh, Compost Wheels merged with Compost Now in 2017. I mentioned Tilthy Rich in Durham, North Carolina, and there's been a few others over the years as well. Uh, so that's expanded the geography uh, at which we uh, do this work. So we're across the Southeast and the Midwest operating uh, in Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, as well as uh, Ohio. So as we've expanded through these different um, you know, partnerships, that, that in and of itself teaches a lot. And you know, we've, we started Compost Now with this idea of accomplishing these core outcomes and when you when we focus on those it's been important to uh, develop the the efficient systems the uh, stable foundation and operating model to allow us to take this to many different places and still be successful and not have that just you know crumble the the infrastructure of the business so along that pathway you know, from the story that I mentioned of in the beginning, the humble beginnings of washing buckets, uh, you know, on, on in a parking lot to then developing the necessary infrastructure. Again, those systems and the processes, the SOPs for the team uh, that keep them safe, that create great working conditions that allow us to continue to accomplish that mission as, uh, again, the demand increases and we respond to that demand. Uh, so we have created different in, we have different infrastructure to handle our different systems and we've created different processes um, and we're always bringing people through those systems and processes to tell that story of how we are accomplishing the work that we're doing, uh, why we do it that way, why we're so meticulous about our systems and our processes, about the equipment that we're uh, you know, putting our team members in and what they're wearing and how they're doing things. So this has been a very... Uh, system systematic and intentional process as we've gone through this work uh, and continuing to to bring the community into it as we've as we've scaled 
along the pathway, uh, of course, impact is tied directly to what we're doing as you know, we've already said is diverting food waste from landfills and building healthy soil. That is, that's what we execute on a daily basis. Uh, and there are many tools to kind of uh, out there that allow you to track your impact, to think about your impact that have evolved in the time that we've been operating. And one of those is, of course, B Corp certification. Um, the B Impact Assessment Tool is something that we've tracked for a long time. We were not uh, a B Corp until uh, about a year and a half ago when we decided that it was time to, to take that step. And one of the reasons uh, why is because as you scale, uh, you both your team and your key stakeholders uh, inherently become a little bit further uh, a, away from the core uh, of what was started and how it was started and the ethos behind it and what you're trying to accomplish. And B Corp is, is a way to continue to uh, track and maintain uh, the intentionality behind the organization while continuing to scale. And so we became a public benefit corporation in the process, which again is an amendment to your corporate charter. And that allows us to, to continue again to, to maintain some of those core uh, principles of the organization as the business continues to grow. So the, a lot of that work that I mentioned in the in the beginning of um, you know being out in the community, educating, bringing them through, it, that hasn't necessarily changed. I think what part of what has evolved is that there are more organizations that exist now that are doing that work and participating in that work, and we are partnering with them. So an example, great example of this in uh, Georgia is Foodwell Alliance, and Foodwell Alliance um, as an organization came about, you know, maybe five years into the work um, of, of compost wheels in, in Georgia. Uh, but Foodwell Alliance came in with, uh, you know, this mission to really resource local growers and support them and soil being a key component of that and have been uh, a partner in very important work of making sure that there were reducing barriers at the government government level to make community composting more accessible across different uh, ways of doing it. Uh, so we've continued to partner with Food Law, Foodwell Alliance. Uh, we continue to bring groups of uh, students and, and many other types of stakeholders through our facilities, both the uh, urban infrastructure and the rural infrastructure of the compost processing facility. And we've started to uh, even expand into providing our services at, at municipal level uh, and providing drop-off programs and starting to pilot curbside programs. So this, this uh, progression of scale also has come along with that progression of cities starting to say, well, you know, we want to offer these types of services within our community. We see the tremendous value in doing that. How do we do that? And that is where I hope and we hope that uh, organizations like Compost Now can step in and still maintain the integrity of the, the type of work that we're trying to do, the integrity of the mission behind it while offering these services within the community and that it doesn't necessarily take the path of uh, all of our other mentalities towards waste in this out of sight, out of mind kind of way. So uh, we've accomplished a lot of this work across focusing on these kind of four key areas. Of course, at the center of it is our services. We have to deliver uh, you know, a reliable service uh, we also have to deliver it in a really effective and efficient way so that we can even make a viable uh, business out of out of this work. Uh, so we do this across our residential, our commercial and municipal municipal members. Um, and then we also have from the outset developed technology that allows us that's both customer and operations facing. It allows our customers to have transparency into the service to be able to see when their collection days are, to be able to set skips, to be able to see their impact, how many pounds they've diverted from the landfill, the different equivalencies um, off of that, and be able to engage with where is that material going? What, what are the farms and gardens in my community that are being supported by this material? And how can I receive that material back? Uh, of course, you can't accomplish any of that without the physical infrastructure. And the physical infrastructure has taken a tremendous amount of time and investment to create. 
uh, that being warehouses in most of our cities that we operate in, what we call these our feedstock hubs, where the material comes in and out of, the drivers start and end their day there. Uh, and it allows us to develop great spaces for us to accomplish this work, to develop the systems and process with, within these facilities. Uh, that allows us to ensure that the material that is going out to the composting facilities, whether our own or our partners, is uh, the highest quality. It's clean. We're, we've decontaminated it as best we can. And then, of course, the impact of the work staying uh, core to uh, to that, uh, you know, off of that center impact of diverting food waste uh, from landfills and building healthy soil, there are other concentric circles of impact that you can start to draw. So how, how are we uh, creating a great place to work? What are the... Uh, what are the ways in which that we're providing value to our team and to our community? And you can really start to dig into that impact. Um, and that's, I think, one of the things that obviously is highlighted within the community composting work is this, this uh, array of value that's created around this, this core of this work. So since we've started, we've diverted 79 million pounds from the landfill and created 26 million pounds of finished compost for our local communities. A quick snapshot of the company, just so you can see where we're at. Um, again, we're across five markets in the Southeast and the Midwest. Um, we have have around 87 full-time employees, 11,000 members, and uh, did 10 and a half million in revenue at the end of 2023. So that is my uh, quick and speedy over overview of our history and our company. Uh, certainly, excited about the conversation around scale and how we're continuing to do this work and look forward to the conversation. Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, I love that you covered the job benefits. That's something that ILSR has done some research and work on is how community composting can actually generate more jobs than centralized composting. So it was cool to see that come up. Um, we do have time for just one question that came in for you. I'm curious if you can speak to uh, this question someone had about organizations of scale, how the pursuit of efficiencies can sometimes lead to loss in services. Um, for example, maybe like accepting a more limited type of materials. Do you have any thoughts on how to and how you guys went about ensuring growth doesn't lead to worse environmental outcomes uh, for the sake of profit? How do you keep it more focused on providing those services and um, quality? Yeah, well, I would say the pursuit of efficiency and like the message that I, I communicated around systematizing things and making sure that it, it is working well and functioning well, the probably the front end outcome that we're trying to achieve in that is is quality service. So there's no shortcuts being created that would impact the quality of our service. So that we've always kept that front and center is that and it's that quality of service has to be a quality of experience for members that are composting with us because as as we all know, uh, you know, it's it's pretty it can be pretty quick that you'll lose the trust and faith of a uh, someone that's participating in this work if you know you leave a stinky bin if you um, you know don't do right by the community in in some way or another. Uh, so we've been, uh, for lack of a better way of saying, we've been hell bent on quality for so long and making sure that we don't compromise that because that is the long term opportunity of this work, not just for us, but for anyone else within our community, there's many other folks within our communities that are composting and providing services in some way. And the message that we always try to keep amongst all of us um, is don't compromise quality because that compromises the effort at the whole. Thanks, yeah, that's definitely something that sets community composting apart. Um, uh, now, Michael, if you want to start sharing your slides, uh, Michael is with Rust Belt Riders based in Cleveland, Ohio, a worker owned cooperative. So he's both co-founder and a worker owner. Um, and we're actually co-hosting our 
cultivating community composting forum this year, our eighth annual forum um, in Cleveland, Ohio. So just if you haven't seen our emails about that already, save the date, October 17th through 19th. It's going to be a fun time to get together and support community composting. We've had a lot of these same conversations about how to make it a really viable food waste reduction solution. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Michael. Thank you, Clarissa. Um, thanks for hosting. Uh, thanks to the ILSR for having us on to talk a little bit about um, our stories. And thanks to David and Christy for, for sharing. Um, yeah, I'm excited to add a little bit to the conversation, hopefully things that people will be able to take with them and, and use to continue to build. Um, so Rust Belt Riders was started in 2014. We're out of Cleveland, Ohio, and we do both commercial and residential composting services. And we also do a blend of uh, a brand of soil blends. Uh, we distinguish the two, the services and the soil blends um, with two different brands. We've got Rust Belt Riders and Till Soil. So what I'm going to do is move through the, the general format that I'm going to use is a little bit of table setting for a scaling discussion, because I think it's helpful to get on the same page in terms of what we mean when we're talking about scaling. And then um, that, that led me as I was thinking about this presentation to some big questions that would be fun to, to share that we've been wrestling with at Rust Belt and Tilt as we've grown over the years. Um, and then we'll get into a little bit of our story for um, how each of those parts of the business has evolved and grown over the years. And that's gonna be largely in pictures. And then we'll end up with what it looks like to have wrestled with those big questions over the course of the organization's growth. Um, there will be some large chunks of text, which is not usually my style. I usually like to use just pictures and talk, but in the beginning, I thought it might be helpful to share some text um, that I'll be reading through so that we can kind of chew on that together. So with that, we'll get into it. Um, what do we mean when we say by scale? So I, I thought it was helpful to distinguish between growing and scaling. So growing, you have costs increasing uh, uh, pretty correlated with the revenue growth. Right. So sales are increasing, costs are increasing. When you're scaling, you want to be growing revenues way more than you're growing costs. So it's really a growth strategy. And um, a really great example that would be like a software as a service, a big investments made up front. And then with each uh, in the software and then each additional user is incremental increase in cost, but uh, significantly more revenue per user. So I, I just thought it was helpful. To, to do that table setting to think through this as we go through the next steps of like what it means to grow and what it means to scale as a community composter or as any mission driven uh, you know values based organization that's that's going to grow and also um, you know asking some questions about that um, some of you may have heard the term unicorns versus uh, zebras the idea there is that the investment community is seeing companies that grow really quickly actually don't it, it's not always a uh, a good sign, right? And oftentimes companies can be pushed to grow faster than they're comfortable or able and they wind up failing because of their growth. So why scale? And I think both of both Christy and David both hit on this really well. It's, um, you know, from a practical and ecological perspective, growing and scaling means that we're diverting more food scraps from the landfill, more material from landfill. Uh, we're lowering emissions, we're making great compost, we're sequestering carbon. We are building uh, resilient food systems. And so if we're using a scaling strategy for that, it means that we've made a significant upfront investment in something that we're going to grow that is going to have incremental costs as we sell more compost or service more accounts. I think important to note also business model wise, certain models only work at scale. So if you're going to invest a certain amount in infrastructure, that only makes sense if you plan to grow the business to a certain size. And I think that's an important thing to think about in the context of the industry that we're working in. Um, and then there's the you know economies of scale we've all heard. Another benefit is when you're buying more things, typically they call, you can buy them for less if you're buying a whole bunch at once, which is something that I think is really important to think about. So the market also, it's determined comp the industry as we know it today, right? And so I think one of the things we've felt for a long time is as community composters, we're distinguishing ourselves from uh, you know other parts of the composting industry. 
And those, you know, the, the standard composting operations, typically very large with big expensive equipment and centralized. And that's not an accident. Market context and, and forces have led to that being how it's done, right? And so uh, I think it's just important to acknowledge that and that uh, there's a reason that that they wound up looking like that. And it has a lot to do with the economic viability of, uh, of uh, what the business model is. And so in order to do the work and not depend on continued grant funding, pay ourselves and our team thriving wage, uh, we need to be bringing in more money than we're spending. And I feel like that's something that might be obvious to most people in business. But I think one of the things that, um, you know, within the community composting uh, coalition, something to emphasize is the, the long term sustainability of the organizations, um, especially those that are not 501c3s C that are maybe getting regular evergreen grants. Um, you know, being able to build sustainable business models is important. And, and, and more money coming in than going out. It's a bath, bathtub model, right? So overall, the business community has shown that it can be economically viable, but has taken an approach that optimizes primarily for economics at the expense of equitable, dis equitable distribution of access to composting services and compost. That leads to some big questions. So how can we prioritize equity and regeneration and still be economically successful when competing against businesses whose values primarily serve profitability? How can we scale and make sure we aren't compromising our values? And if we need investment to build infrastructure and scale, where will, where will, where will it come from? And how do we know the investors share our values? So now we'll get into a little bit of Rust Belt's journey and Tilth's journey over the years. Um, we had meaningful data starting in 2015 for commercial pounds, uh, pounds hauled per year. So you can see the, the organization uh, growth trajectory over the past few years, obviously 2020 slowed things down with COVID. Uh, 2020, 2021 is when we introduced the residential services. And then we brought on a chain of grocery stores in 2021 as well. Uh, the organization started on bicycles. So this is myself and co-founder Daniel Brown. Uh, we were schlepping around Ohio City in Cleveland, Ohio. If I didn't mention that earlier, we're based out of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, we're schlepping around Cleveland with uh, 300 pounds of food scraps plus Dan on the back of a bicycle. And we were composting at a distributed network of community gardens in Cleveland. From there, we went through a handful of incubators where we reinvested all the prize money to purchase this vehicle, which was a E250 cargo van with a lift gate. It could hold 10 64 gallon containers. This is the third member of the team, Jesse Williams. Um, we didn't know about bio bags yet, I guess. Or we, we were apparently still using plastic liners. Uh, at this point, we were still working with a, a distribution of uh, community gardens, urban farms, and a licensed two facility at this point. Then we moved forward with 16 foot box trucks. And we grew that to about a fleet of three trucks before uh, increasing the capacity yet again to a 26 foot truck. Um, this is the biggest truck you can drive without a CDL. And then this is our drop site. So hopefully for all the community composters out there to give folks an idea of kind of like how we went from step to step and, and you know, from a tactile perspective, what this looked like um, for us and our team as we continued to grow. Um, we make uh, two, we make a National Organics Program certified soil blend, which is why you see them split here with a wall. Uh, the NOP compost and soil blends can't have the bioplastics in it, so we have to separate those out. And then most recently, we invested in this international truck. Um, it uh, watertight dumping bed. It also has a single can tipper on the side. And I'll say it's it's been a total game changer. I, I, our team has been um, really stoked on the amount of physicality that it takes out of the work. Uh, sure. Um, as many of you know, the you know moving cans around is extremely labor intensive. So the more we can ask the robots to do, the better. You know, we've had a lot of success in that. And that's the that's the most recent kind of uh, investment we've made in the commercial hauling department. This is number of residential subscribers per year. Like I said, that program didn't really start meaningfully until 2019. And this is a combination of both drop off and pickup program. So we do a curbside pickup where we swap the buckets out. 
and with a clean bucket. And then we do a community drop-off program where we partner with, um, we do have some municipal public private partnerships where we have contracts with, with cities and they sponsor drop-off locations for the residents to bring material. But we've also, um, uh, that program started by partnering with just public facing groups like it could be a library, it could be a coffee shop. We've partnered with grade schools, just uh, trafficked areas that would be easy for people to come drop off their food scraps. And we deliver that service with a Dodge ProMaster, a couple of Dodge ProMasters. And we manually clean those buckets. So this is kind of a rack setup that we have for when we're cleaning our containers out. This is what the drop-off sites, this is one of the drop-off sites. Some of them have a little bit more infrastructure. They're kind of caged in with some corrals. They're painted, but we try to make sure that they're um, very visible. I believe this one's at a park in a suburb close by Cleveland. And this is a map of the locations of the drop-off sites. So we serve, um, they're all over Cuyahoga County. In the beginning, when we were making compost, we were turning them by hand at the distributed uh, community gardens. This was a garden that actually had a tractor on site. So we were able to increase the footprint. And in Ohio, the regulation was that as long as you were operating under 300 square feet of composting, as long as you uh, yeah, didn't have any active material on more than 300 square feet, you didn't need a permit. So. In the early days, we were operating, operating multiple sites on um, uh, that had active piles that were less than 300 square feet. And we actually were able to lobby the Ohio EPA to increase that size to 500 square feet. And this is one of the bays that we built to be able to do that. So as we're outgrowing the different sites and the different um, the, the network and picking up more material, we needed to kind of evolve and adapt to be able to accommodate that material. This is uh, Director of Soil Nathan Rutz standing on top of a, one of our forms, we called them. We had um, five of those each, or it was measured out to be no more than 500 square feet. So the active material was in those piles. And then we outgrew that site and we moved on to, this was another site that we added. Um, and this is a class two licensed facility in Ohio in Cuyahoga County. And we started making compost with windrow turner. Um, this is a Coima turner that we fix on the front of a bobcat. It's a really cool machine at that scale. And it helps you get the most use out of the tractor too. We also picked up a John Deere 244J to be able to help continue to move equipment around between needing to turn the piles and receiving material. We needed another loader. So we moved forward with this loader. Here's a video of the first trommel screener we purchased. I believe it's in Miami. Um, this is a simply trommel screener for people that are at that scale. Um, it's relatively small. I mean, it just, it's just, the, the different tiers are wild because something that seems like overkill one year is too small the next. And so I think that's one of the big things that we learned over the years was um, thinking bigger than we probably needed to because we've had a handful of instances of purchasing equipment that was, um, we thought the right size and then we grew too fast for it. And then all of a sudden it wasn't the right size. So um, this is a deck screener that we were using at the same time as well for uh, basically blending the, uh, uh, blending the amendments into the compost for the soil blends and pulling out the big aggregate if we happen to pick up any piece of blacktop or something like that in the process. And then we recently moved forward with a larger screener because we outgrew the other one. And so this is what we're using at the moment to screen material um, on a, a setup right now that's actually not ideal. We're, we're in a couple of different places spread out for our, for our production operation. And so we're in the process of hopefully securing uh, a centralized location for ourselves. Uh, in addition to the other partnerships that we have, um, there's a, you know, our vision is to create a distributed network of small to medium scale size facilities across Cuyahoga County, uh, of which our site would be one of just, just one of maybe a, at least a dozen of those. Uh, we see that even the, the scale site that I showed you earlier, the largest of those, um, based on the amount of food scraps that are going into the landfill, 
As we continue to do a good job rescuing food scraps and materials from landfills, we don't have enough processing infrastructure at the moment to be able to handle that material. And so that's why we're moving forward with um, our larger facility that will be a network of small to, to medium scale operations here in Northeast Ohio. And we make soil blends from that compost. Um, it's our third year bringing those to market in a meaningful way. We use National Organics Program certified compost to make seed starting mixes uh, for seed starting mixes, raised bed fill, uh, cannabis blend, and then a house plant blend. 2023, we did six and a half million pounds. And here's some numbers about businesses on route, drop off sites, and members subscribed. At the moment, we got 24 FTEs. And because we're a worker-owned cooperative, 15 of the 15 of the people that work with us are also equal owners of the business. So going back to those questions, how can we prioritize equity and regeneration? And these are questions that we're, we're asking ourselves all along the journey that I just showed you. How can we prioritize equity and regeneration and still be economically successful when competing against businesses whose values primarily serve profitability? And I think investment horizons is something that's on our mind because um, if we think long-term, then uh, the, the return on those investments makes sense. But if investors are looking for a short return on their investment, then they're probably looking at the long, wrong industry. And uh, if we take you know short return on investments as the, the way to go, I think our current ecological situation is, uh, um, look where that's gotten us, right? Like if that was the if that was the way to do it, uh, the results of, that we're facing today are the product of that. So thinking on a more long term horizon for those investments, um, and then working with stakeholders to change the narrative and, and quantify the economic impact of the externalized costs. So, for example, what are the costs of environmental racism and food apartheid, and why are they being left out of the equation? Because ultimately. When we're talking about scaling, we're talking about economic solutions and making ourselves competitive in a marketplace. And when certain costs are left out of the calculation, then it allows folks that don't have uh, businesses with those, uh, that don't have the same values uh, to be able to leave those costs out of their calculations. And um, that distorts the, the way that the market is gonna either accommodate or not accommodate certain types of businesses. And then also what savings are being seen when we when when composters are there, when community composters are there. Uh, I think there's also externalized benefits that businesses like ours bring to um, to our communities and to our ecology that don't make their way into those calculations as well. So reframing the narrative to include those and doing the research um, and working with organizations that are doing the research to make sure that those are included in those calculations is going to be super important. And then that research and the process of changing that narrative should result in additional support from NGOs or in the form of policy from uh, government at, at all levels. We also need to help our partners share the story of our collaboration, right? So in a world of greenwashing, people are looking for authentic solutions. And so, um, we're doing authentic work and connecting with the folks that are partnering with us to make this real, to breathe this into existence is, is also really important. And then also collaborating and sharing resources with one another. Um, there's a way to do this where a rising tide actually lifts all boats and we can collectively scale together around a shared set of values that leverages our power, both from a social perspective, but also in a very tactile, real economic way that sees in, uh, ultimately sees results in the um, bottom line of the business as well. How do we scale and make sure we're not compromising those values? So uh, at Rust Belt, we do different events for stakeholders to make sure that we're keeping them in the loop, but also building community. We believe that we exist through our relationships. And so facilitating the cultivation of those relationships is very important. Uh, we also have an annual vision meeting where every member of our team we basically have a paid day where we reschedule the routes and we all go in and we take a minute to think about, okay, let's revisit the vision. Let's revisit the mission. Let's look at the values and break into some groups and have a whole facilitated day that helps inform the board who's charged with making decisions on who, uh, ultimately rubber meets the road decisions for the business. Uh, that vision day informs what the board decides to do. 
And then having those really clear as a kind of North Star. Another important thing is we like to say, put the fish on the table. Uh, it's an idiom meaning if there's an issue, don't hide it, put it up there and talk about it. So there are weird contra contradictions and conflicts that are inherent in doing something that benefits ecology in the context of a system that incentivizes ecocidal behavior. We're, we're in a system right now that's actively doing harm to ecologies and we're trying to combat that. And then our mission is in the bylaws and in our operating agreement. So in a very formal way, uh, it's, it's part of the DNA of the business. And then also don't underestimate the importance of building the relationships, like I said before, especially from the beginning, being aware of biases in relationships that we're building. So again, in this context, we're prioritizing how we make decisions um, and how we prioritize our time. And we're gonna be incentivized to build relationships with certain groups for certain reasons and not with others. And oftentimes uh, can lead to building relationships with uh, wealthier and whiter communities. We've created a working group within our organization that's uh, taken point on elevating the priorities of those values and um, what that means from a tactile sense for the business independent of the economic piece. Because like we said before, there are these weird tensions. Um, we can get into fundraising, I think later, Clarissa, because that was a question that was going to be asked. So we'll just wrap there. I had a couple of other operational elements, but we can just maybe move to questions. Great. Thank you for that, Michael. I like that you got into a lot of the nuance of the question behind scaling up and scaling up versus growth. Um, um, taking a look at some of the questions that folks have had for you. I guess if you could speak a little bit more, you mentioned policy um, and that if you could come back on camera, <laughs> I still got a question just for you. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I'm curious. You said that our kind of incentive structure is out of whack right now, but what kind of policy do you think could make it easier for composters to be able to stay true to this mission, to their mission of community composting while scaling up? Um, are there any hurdles that you guys encountered that you would recommend government improve? What is the kind of role of those folks on the call that are local government? And I'll open this question up to David and Chris to you as well, but I'm curious if you could elaborate a little bit about how that plays out. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um... The first two that come to mind are one, some kind of surcharge on landfilling material. So it's more, if it's, if it's, there are externalized costs to bringing materials to landfills. So if we captured what those real costs are and added them to the price of the tipping fee to tip to landfills and made it as expensive as it ought to be to take material and throw it in the hole in the ground and then um, have the methane emissions come out, uh, it would be less expensive to compost. And so, um, that would be one thing is like surcharges or um, finding a way to to incentivize the composting um, from a market perspective. And then the other one that comes to mind, and this might be specific to Ohio, but I know that a lot of composters wrestle with the way that stormwater runoff is treated. And so if we can distinguish the runoff from a compost site from the uh, runoff from a landfill, I think that would be really great for the industry. Um, treating water running off of a pile of wood chips the same as water running out of a, off of a pile of like landfill material, um, I think is, uh, I don't think it's a good idea. I, think, I don't think it's the same thing. And I think it's hurting compost operations to treat it that way. Thanks for that. David and Christy, do either of you have any thoughts on policy, either incentives or removing roadblocks for community composters? making it easier for them to scale up. Yeah, I, I would just jump in to say that I, I do think there are uh, multiple opportunities for uh, zoning and land use uh, to be in the conversation for this work. Uh, you know, the for composting to be a protected land use within such as like agricultural zoning uh, that it, it in a place like 
Georgia and North Carolina, uh, where there's quite a bit of rural land still within proximity to the urban centers where a lot of this material is being uh, collected, generated. Uh, you know, there there is a disappearance of um, industrial land, which is typically where uh, a lot of this work is approved to be within. So the more we can tie this this work to agriculture to urban agriculture uh, within the appropriate scales, uh, that is really important. So we're participating in those conversations in certain ways. Yeah, and I'll just add, I, I agree with both David and Michael. I mean, definitely highly needed changes. I didn't go way too long on what we need to change for our policies and regulation to make community composting a very successful option. Um, for us, in the DC metro region, like you said, land is such a, like a scarce commodity, right? It's too expensive, there's not enough of it, and it's being utilized by, by spaces that just are not feasible for composting community gardens, locations that really wanna do more. So um, having the ability and flexibility to zone um, as well as utilize land in these um, kind of odd spaces um, within a regulatory requirement would be extremely helpful, especially if we want to stay in this decentralized model size. Um, also, like Michael said, all, almost all of our regulations are based on hazardous waste. Um, this is not a hazardous waste. My background before I started composting was in hazardous waste remediation. I specifically wanted to go to composting because there was less <laughs> less exposure to terrible things that you might experience when you're in hazardous waste. So I found it very surprising that there is a lot of regulation of composting based on hazardous waste regulation. So if that could change, that'd be great. For our um, compost, our finished compost, also I'd love to show and present that that material is also not hazardous waste and should also be regulated in a way that promotes um, all the amazing things that compost can do that everyone in this call knows. So um, less regulation on the finished products as well would be extremely helpful. Thanks, yeah. And um, ILSR definitely does a lot of work on this. So maybe we can link in the chat to some of our model policy libraries for local government, federal government that are interested in seeing what kind of policies can promote more decentralized composting. Um, Michael, you mentioned you were going to be getting into funding, so we did get a lot of questions about securing funding, how you did that, compost crew, you spoke to a little bit about this um, regarding grants and contracts, but it sounded like, Michael, you guys kind of stayed away from the grants, or we had a question as to whether you did, um, so maybe you can speak a little bit to that, and then I'll pass it to David for how you uh, navigated securing funding as you scaled up. But Michael, first, if you could speak to that. Yes, so grants are great. We've gotten grants and they've been awesome. Um, and I think everyone should go after all of the market development grants that we can, but they're not a sustainable way to build a business. And so that's kind of where I might have come off as being anti-grant. It's it's I think grants are great, but they're just they're just not a way to sustainably run the business. They're a really great way to offset that initial startup cost that I mentioned at the beginning when we were talking about scaling, right? Like if you're getting a loader or a big truck or something like that, definitely go for the grant. Um, but for so we've gotten that capital for some equipment that we have, but for other fundraising we've we did a handful of um, pitch competitions and stuff like that that we were able to get some funding early days and then when we raised uh we raised a round of class b preferred stock and we used safe notes uh, stands for simple agreement for future equity getting a little into the weeds but it's similar to a convertible note so we used some we used safe notes and class b preferred stock to raise um capital in the company those are class b investors and then our cooperative structure um basically gives the class b investors a board seat and then all the the rest of the board seats are uh filled by people elected by the worker owners and then we've got a couple of traditional bank loans as well so that was also um for trucks and things like that uh which was no different than any other business you just need to be airtight around what the efficiencies are going to create and then show that the cash is going to be available to afford the debt 
David, I see you nodding. Have you had a similar experience at Compost Now? Oh uh, yeah, I think some some of those things are are similar. I would say for about the first seven years of the work, it was uh, bootstrapped and break even, so there was no um, outside investment taken. There was, of course, uh, kind of piecemeal grant opportunities that came about that were helpful along the way, but by no means did those grants, you know, make or break the uh, the work. Uh, so after the, that kind of seven year mark, we did raise, uh, a small round of funding that w primarily is from values aligned investors. So you hear the term impact investors. Um, we really over our journey of starting to work with investors post that kind of seven year mark, uh, found it to be beneficial to find the, uh, groups mostly individuals, family offices, those types of folks that see the mission behind what we're trying to accomplish and see uh, really the the long-term horizon of how, how this long it's going to take for this, this work to uh, be developed. Uh, so I think that would be what I would emphasize is just making sure that as you look for outside investment, potentially, uh, that you find those folks that align with what you're trying to accomplish. And then, of course, um, traditional debt, just like Michael said, you just have to be able to service that debt. And it has to make sense with what the what the business is doing. Christy, do you have anything more to add about your experience uh, working through grants, contracts, if either one of those has been uh, easier to deal with than the other? If you have any tips for scaling up composters? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't have to reiterate, uh, we've done the same thing that Michael and David has done. We are a for-profit for a reason. We want to be able to utilize money in a different way than a nonprofit can do, which means we cannot rely on grants to be able to operate. Um, and that means investments and different things like that. Um, one big thing I'd like to shout out is long-term contracts are a huge part of sustainability when it comes to collection and composting. Um, the more longer term contracts, if you're a municipality that you provide, gives more financial freedom and ability for more community composters to be able to do what they can do. Um, unfortunately, we've had a few municipalities that give extremely short term pilots as a way of contracts. And that is extremely difficult for any company to be able to support um, at a very small size, right? Like one year to three year. Um, if you're putting all this infrastructure and investment into a contract and then it doesn't exist thereafter, that can be extremely difficult. So if you are a municipality or a long, uh, you know, decision, decision maker in any way for policy, please provide more long-term contracts because that's also a huge part of our support. We just got a question. Do any composters share large infrastructure investments such as equipment sharing cooperatives? And I'm going to hand this one to Michael. Uh, maybe you can say a little bit about the work you've been doing within the Community Composter Coalition. Thanks. Clarissa, will you repeat the question once more? Yes, it was, do any composters share large infrastructure investments such as equipment sharing slash cooperatives? Yeah, so I mean, that's one of, I think, a whole bunch of things that we could do together as a, a network of community composters. So um, in partnership with a whole bunch of awesome people, including the ILSR and a whole bunch of community composters, we've recently submitted an application for a USDA planning grant to explore that very idea and a handful of others. So the, the intuition is that there's a place for us as a, a group of small to medium scale composters to leverage our scale and maintain our community roots by, and also continue to be autonomous by organizing ourselves a little bit more intentionally. And one of the ways we could do that would be through, um, you know, if we have a, we could get the, a huge screener potentially and then spitballing and then have it just serve an entire region, right? Because there might be the scale of operations might need to be run. You might not need to run that screener all the time. So how can we share uh, a really big screener that we wouldn't, one, wouldn't be able to buy on our own and two, wouldn't actually need all the time. But instead we kind of go in on it on like a share basis or something like that. So that's an idea there. Um, I don't know of anybody that's doing that at the moment, but it would be, I think it, it would be awesome. The other opportunities there are like buying things we all purchase in higher volume and get a low, getting a lower price. 
um, we could also find a way to offer our services together to um, you know, a, a company that might have national offices and they, they might not want to go through a procurement process with 50 different small businesses. So they set up a portal and, you know, there's a opportunity for a broker type uh, role there too for the group. So not that I know of yet, but there's something cooking. If you're interested in that, please reach out for me, uh, reach out to me and I'll, I'll, loop, I'll put you in the loop. Yeah. And definitely if you aren't already connected to the coalition, I recommend you apply to that. Um, I'm also curious, Michael mentioned that you've had to consider equity a little bit in scaling up and getting investment um, that isn't grants. The, the places that it comes from is one way that considering equity comes up and you're scaling up. Can Christy or David, either of you speak to how you've been intentional about equity throughout your process of diverting more food waste and community partnerships or any piece of this? Yeah, I, I would start by saying the garden and farm partner program that we've had since our inception is a really important way that we're making sure that, again, that mission of diverting food waste from landfills is being accomplished, but then the cycling of nutrients back into our community through these farms and garden partnerships and the various partners that we have to direct this material uh, to various farms and gardens has been really critical uh, from an equi equity lens uh, of accomplishing this work. And then, I, then the other part of it is, I think the focus on trying to continue to scale this work and influence a future where uh, more cities are participating in, in these services and working with companies like uh, all of us on this call uh, is key in how we bring these services to more people. Um, and move beyond just the kind of like boutique subscription level services that a lot of us have offered a, for a long time. Of course, there is going to be a certain demographic that can uh, pay for those services. But over time, we can have more influence in scaling these, in scaling compost and bringing compost to more communities, I think, through these, these opportunities with municipalities. That's one way. <laughs> Christy, yeah. do you have to, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I wouldn't say too much more. I mean, definitely answered the same thing that we're looking at. How do we make composting available for everyone? That could be food scrap collection, diversion, but also finished product compost um, acquisition ability to utilize. Uh, so one huge part of this is trash is something that everyone uses and handles and pays for. And so if every single person was able to do food scrap collection, then the cost of collection would be less than what would be for trash. Um, so if you're a person that has to pay trash through your apartment or through your municipality, or as an individual person, we wanna get to the point where food scrap collection is at or lower than that price to make it eligible for everyone to be able to utilize. One big part of that is drop-offs, um, like Michael is indicating. I mean, that's a huge part of a shared base of, of costs. That's extremely low. Also, side note, um, my husband was living in uh, Ohio for a year and we contracted with one of your drop-offs. It's awesome. So, I mean, that is a great way to just anyone that's, you know, in a, you know, like DC is a pretty frequented area. You might not have the ability to do your own contract or in an apartment. So using the farmer's markets and drop-off spaces are a great way that might be free even to utilize. Um, more municipalities subscribe um, using it available for everyone would also help, but also the finished compost. People don't talk about that as much. Um, more municipalities that can offer finished compost back to individuals that want to utilize it for healthy soils, especially for community gardens that might be supporting um, individuals from different economical backgrounds would be amazing. Um, some municipalities are doing that and supporting that, but more focus in that area would also be great. Um, we've spoken a little bit about the importance of reflecting on the mission and the core values as, as the operation scales up. Um, so now I'm going to ask you guys to reflect, and I won't call on anyone, so I hope someone volunteers, but I'm curious, we've talked a lot about the successes in staying true to the values. Um, are there any instances that you regret or wish you did differently in the process of scaling up? that you think others could learn from?
Michael. Try to be brief. Um, I'm thinking an instance where like greatest strengths point to greatest weaknesses. And so we're, we've always been very scrappy. And I think being scrappy has led to us kind of operating from a more like uh, scarcity mindset. And I think that's what led to us getting things that did, weren't actually big enough to be with us for as long as we needed them to be. So we weren't thinking on this kind of like 10x, you got to think 10x. Uh, is this going to work when your business grows? Maybe it's not 10x, but maybe it's three or four. But, you know, thinking far enough ahead and building things that feel like they're too big for right now so that you're not breaking things and then trying to pick up the pieces. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to move on to a final closing question for you all. Curious, what is next for you? Are you scaling up? Are you growing? Now we know there's a difference between the two. Um, how are, are you still, does that look like diverting more food waste or are you growing and changing and evolving in other ways? I'm sure it's both, um, but I think it would be great if we could go around and all answer that and starting with David. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, I think we're, we are definitely have our eye towards the opportunity to continue to bring these services to more people through these municipal uh, contracts and opportunities. It, it's certainly happening around the country. Uh, it's a lot slower in the Southeast. Uh, and so we are, are trying to help uh, bring, bring those opportunities to fruition. A lot of that's coming through pilot programs right now. Uh, but I think there's, there is some opportunity that exists in charting those, that path forward now, um, you know, versus waiting for the mandates or waiting for the things to happen here. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're excited about that opportunity. Uh, I think also paying attention to how the industry is evolving and, and, um, you know, being present within that so that we can, uh, we can stay relevant as this work continues to evolve rapidly. And as I think larger waste, traditional waste groups uh, will be entering this work uh, and doing things maybe not how we exactly would want to do it. So what, what, how do we interact with that? How do things evolve? How do we uh, try to continue to preserve the, the good work that's happening? Christy? Yeah, I mean, it's an exciting time to be a composter. So it's amazing, one, that ILSR is getting us all together to talk about all the amazing things that we're doing so we can all grow together. So it's been amazing getting to know all of you and uh, to learn from one, one another. For us as a company, um, we're excited to, one, continue to divert food scraps. Um, there's so much, so much food scrap waste. Um, even with all the work that we're doing, um, we're just, just tapping the surface. I'm sure all of you are seeing that as well. So we're going to try to continue to grow our collection service so it's available for everyone at all scales. Um, on the composting side, which is what I do, um, we're excited to continue to promote more ways of decentralized composting, whether that's more compost outposts, whether that's being able to provide technology like this that could then be replicated for all of you. We're trying to still work on that. We're working on also providing different scales. So this is really great in a small decentralized modeled system. We would love to get in between that centralized large scale size to a little bit larger than this decentralized, just shipping container size. So we're looking at how can we get to some of these medium size scales to really help promote with more finished, high quality finished compost in our region, um, things like that. So working on both factors. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, similar to um, as David mentioned, for the residential program, we're focusing on public-private partnerships with municipalities to to grow um, to grow there. Um, and then on the uh, soil blend end of things, uh, as I mentioned, we're hoping to consolidate our operations here soon, and uh, we're working with local independent retailers and garden stores to carry the soil blends as opposed to doing kind of direct sales from ourselves. So we've kind of hit that point where we're ready to start selling skids to to local garden centers instead of bags to people out the front of our shop so that, that's what's next in store for us super exciting thanks for sharing that and all of your experience and how you navigated scaling up you guys are really 
model success stories for how being mission driven in composting is not only can compete, but can actually be an asset. So really appreciate you being with us here today and inspiring everyone else. Um, a quick note that there's again, a part two of this series that you can register now for in June. And when you close out this webinar, a survey is gonna pop up to ask you what you thought of it. So please fill that out. It would be super helpful for us. Thanks everybody for joining us today. And thanks again to our panelists. Have a good rest of your day.